I've been thinking a lot about sort of the re-enchantment of the world. Where, whereabouts are you, Mike, at the moment? Uh, I'm in Lexington, Kentucky. So uh, okay, yeah. So when the um, coronavirus hit New York, like when it first started to hit really bad, I just decided I was living month to month in a place, and it was like it's a one one room studio, and I just felt like I could see the right on the wall. <laughs> And yeah. uh, so, oh, what like you're going to be stuck in a box for the gonna be stuck in a box. No, it was yeah, a great sure. choice, Mike. It was a really yeah, great choice. A good move, man. And so I had never been here. I had never been to Kentucky, to Lexington, anyway. I think I've driven through Kentucky, but uh, I have a good friend down here who's involved in the music down here. And there's a lot of great, um, a lot of great country acts coming out of this part of Kentucky right now. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, so that was a little bit of my, of my reasoning, but I also was just kind of like, well, where's an inexpensive rent where I can get a backyard right. where I Who know is- like one person. Right. So how you said, you said there's like a, a big kind of country scene there then. Like yeah, there right. is. Yeah. yeah. Right. It, it kind of harkening back to the, what I still consider kind of the golden age of country music and the guys like Waylon Jennings and. Um, Hank Jr. in the early 70s was a fucking monstrous guy. I mean, he just had so many classic records one after the other. He's kind of fallen out of fashion uh, because of his politics and whatever. He just does the Monday Night Football song. (laughs) Um, But there's a a kind of resurgence of that. So there's this guy, Tyler Childers, who's down here, who's been putting out just solid records. And um, John Prine was wasn't from Kentucky, but his grandparents lived in Muhlenberg County, which is where he'd spend his summers and where he really started. And he's written a lot of songs about the area too. Um, since he passed, his, re- that, his record label that he founded has been um, signing, some, signing some, some artists. Kelsey Walden is a pretty great uh, singer songwriter. Um, but yeah, just good like down home, uh, down home what, shit. What label is that? That's Oh Boy Records. Oh, right. That's famous, isn't it? That's yeah. A, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of yeah. yeah, right, yeah. Uh, so, and what is it? Is it kind of like so straight down the line? I mean, I don't know if that really exists, but I was going to say straight down the line country, or is it like more alt country, or is it is it quite traditional, I suppose? I, mean, I guess it's, um, yeah, somewhere in that mix. It's all, um, I mean, Tyler Childers, it's like fiddles, mandolin, banjo, you know, nice. uh, drums and bass with that as well um and he has a lot of kind of shit kicking songs about getting drunk and doing cocaine and driving around back roads kind of stuff Mm -hmm. but it's not the like the bro country is this it's not the commercial slick stuff that just sounds like an advertisement for a truck Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's kind of been the shit that this has been happening for a long time right right where it's like is this a fucking diarrhea commercial um (laughs) <laughs> you know and then also they also because that, that level of country too is just like straight up they just took the signifiers right and they're just like well say pickup truck say blue <laughs> jeans say yeah. blonde hair you know it's just like oh. right 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 um but like everything got the treatment didn't it like in the 80s and stuff like that it yeah was just like, right. everything has to get like you know it has the 80s gloss stuck on it and the, and then it, a lot of it stayed didn't it in it, certain it areas did. yeah it did. And with country music, it's like now you listen to the 80s and 90s stuff and it's kind of like, no, nah, it's not bad compared to like where it went. <laughs> well, I, I, you know? well, it's worse now, you mean? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, shit, really, right. Well, actually, you know, 80s in general, when you go back and listen to 80s stuff, I'm always like, oh my, the musicianship is amazing. What, did I, what was I thinking? Like right. people could really play. Like anybody yeah. who got recorded in the 80s who wasn't yeah. a punk band. They could really play, regardless. Yeah, and, of and actually, it's true. And also, like, yeah, the, you realize just how how tightened up everything is now. I mean, there is actually you can actually feel feel, even though at the time it seemed totally kind of yeah, it artificial. seems so so artificial. Yeah. But yeah, but actually, there's more like the pockets wider a lot of times. Yeah, and stuff. it just had too much reverb. <laughs> yeah, the drums, the reverb drums, man. You put yeah. fucking a bunch of reverb on drums, and it's just awful. Yeah. <laughs> 
like Def Leppard, isn't it? Like, like, yeah. 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 I mean, that thing that you were saying that the other day, uh, Dom, when you're always talking about like the, my spatialization and my mi- mixes, part of oh, that yeah. is because it's a reaction to that. Right. And so I'll often just not use any reverb on, on a track or something. Right, right. And so right, it'll right. end up in a weird space, depending on how it's recorded, that uh-huh. where the whole rest of the track isn't. Because you know what you're, the way I was taught to mix, you, you set up a, a couple of reverb buses and right. kind of almost by default, everything is going to go a little bit into those so yeah. that it's like in the same room. Yeah. Right. And, it's a, and it's amazing what happens when you just don't do that. Right. You know, and you're like, whoa. Yeah, well, because you're not you're not doing anything, are you? To to uh, well, I suppose you said it like in the same room, but you you know those those things have just got their kind of immutable characteristics, right? Yeah. <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> <saying. laughs> does it I, does, does it work if you don't do that? If you don't put any reverb on stuff, or does it sound it, like it sounds like his music? Yeah, it's, yeah. That's, <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't conscious of it, but, but I think Dom has identified yeah. that that might be the Sarth sound. Yeah. yeah. Do you know like, what? The thing is, I found I heard someone who actually the like, first time I've heard uh, like another artist that sort of like reminds me of you a little bit, and it's this this girl called. Uh, I thought you would like it. I mean, she's she's not as hardcore as you. It's, it's you know, she's definitely good. There's definitely some reverb in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which I was it's like, not that I don't ever use reverb. <laughs> it's just that I don't think that it's obligatory. Right. No, fair enough. I mean, definitely when I was when I was learning to mix, I mean, I mean I remember this. And this was like late 90s. And I remember being taught like imagine the room. This is your sound stage. Like, you know, you know, start with the ba- the kick and the bass, you know, make them, you know, then you start to lay your instruments out across the soundstage and then, you know, make sure that you lay them, you know, up in frequency so that you cover all the frequencies and, you know, and you do all this stuff and you arrange your instruments in the room. And like, I did all that at some point in the past. And then there was, yeah. s- at some point I just stopped. I was like, I, uh, no yeah, you know, I'm not really trying to recreate a band in a room here. Yeah, like that's, yeah. what, The right. stuff I do isn't, that's not what I'm doing. <clears throat> right? right i'm not attempting to simulate some live music experience that you thought you could have right mm. but if you know yeah, totally. like a lot of the stuff that, that mike does uh for example i would want to have the sense that i'm in a room like right. it's part of right. the delivery of the material right yeah 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 Who, what, did you look her up don yeah tell tell sounds Right, right. T A L sounds. Uh, I think she's American. It's a girl. Hmm. So, yeah. And I was yeah, have a listen because it's it's quite. It, yeah, it, was, it was really good actually. It was nice. It was quite refreshing. I think it's all improvised as well. Awesome! So, I can't wait to yeah. check it out. Yeah, yeah. But but that's that's an interesting thing actually because I I was thinking, when you were saying about with the <clears throat> with uh, you know not wanting to re- recreate what's you know like a band in a room for for that kind of music. I suppose that is that thing like you know. Film, the point where film, you know, say for instance, stops being like trying to uh, put theater on a screen, you know, or that right, right, yeah. That's, I mean, that's right. how I think about it. That's how I think yeah. about the stuff I'm doing, right? But is, then, is it- but then, of course, you say like, say, say what Mike does, or I suppose what I do as well. It's kind of like you, you, can, it's like, well, that that kind of, you know, that is it is relevant for this kind of music you know it's kind of like you want there, there needs to be that context and that kind of story to it as well it's mm-hmm. quite important to the feel isn't it yeah you know, it, it could actually get really distracting yeah. if you're in that form and then you mixed it that other way you know so like like if 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 you had a a, a simple rock piece or like a or like a acoustic guitar and voice piece or you know or a five piece band with pretty traditional instrumentation and you did something really weird with the mix, it's gonna, it's gonna take, it's actually gonna, it can distract, distract from the material, right? Because we do have a, um, a symbolic language and an expectation and, and our brains can envision it, even if it's not conscious, even for people who aren't conscious that they're doing it, it it's, it's still there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many records that have been made that have great songs on them that if they're not kind of handled in the right way, they end up, not sounding great, just not delivering what the intention of the song is. I mean, I've been, I've done that to myself. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> stuff I, I recorded where it's just like, let's put horns on it. You get kind of excited right. in the act of making the thing. And then the ideas in the room feel cool. And then, you know, or you want to stretch the ideas to a certain degree. And then the idea that you end up with is like stretched a little too far. <laughs> it's like, yeah. ah, it should have just been a guitar and a bass. Yeah, you know, I think that like I'm 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 really on this trip of 
everybody should record multiple versions of stuff. Recording yeah. so cheap now. And yeah. before, you know, we just had to do that canonical version. But I'm just going to keep advocating for we should all do five versions of things. You know, yeah, as yeah. long as you as long as it's not um, costing too much. Yeah, I, I think I think I kind of I I overdid that one a few years back. You know, <laughs> just before doing Emperors of Rome, I like you know I had like a handful of songs that I must have done like you know twenty versions of each of them. You know, and it was getting crazy. I was like, and then Ali was like, I never want to hear that fucking song. No, well, did you? <laughs> like, in, no, what any, I'm saying is, did you, in any form? Yeah, you know I mean, I was like, what if what if I what if I just keep the chorus from it and then I just put the no, but like, I'm no, saying no. release them all. I'm saying release all of them. Release all of them. Yeah, because uh, yeah. you don't know which one's the best. You've been listening to it too much. At this point, you've heard that song a thousand times and your wife's yelling at you, right? It's like, you know, I just... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's what a lot of like... Uh, that's definitely in the folk tradition of what people do. I mean, and sometimes you find, you know, because there is no definitive. Like the Beatles, obviously, they those are definitive renditions, but I don't even think there's many bands like that who have that definitive of a, of a sound and of a recording. And, and they you invented have, that. What you run into, though, is like with Ramblin' Jack Elliott, it's like, oh, I want to hear him sing Buffalo Skinners. And then you got to go through like four records to find which version is the version that, that like, you he really hear. kills on. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, Skip Shirey said that one time uh, <clears throat> when I was kind of thro starting to throw this idea at him. I think we did this one co collaborative video and there were two, ver it was down to, we did like 12 takes. And it was down to two versions. And I was like, let's just release both of them. And he's like, no, one of them's the right one. Uh, why would I release the one that's not the right one? Even if it's hard for us to figure out which one's the right one, one of them's right. the right one.
And then, and I was saying similar stuff about, you know, releasing multiple versions of songs. I mean, he's, his view, at least at the time, he might have updated his view since then. That was a long time ago, but like five years ago or at least. But he was saying, no, there's a canonical version of my stuff. Mm. And the people who listen to me want to know that they can go hear the, the version that is the version. Mm. Right. Right. Which is a strong stance, too. I mean, it, you know. Yeah. I mean, I found it quite, quite uh, sort of disorientating when I realized that, say, um, what was it? it? Vicious, like Lou Reed's Vicious, that that was the only time he'd sung it like that. Do you know what I mean? Like the version I know from, you know, that we know from Transformer is like the only time it was ever done like that. And it's oh, kind of like, really? Yeah. And it's kind of like, fuck really it's yeah. just like, yeah, that's, that's just that's weird you know what it, I'm like, hit <laughs> me with a flower <laughs> every hour man uh, i mean but you know it, huh. I, I will say like like lou was particularly that way and particularly with delivering his vocals all right mm -hmm. he used to say this thing like i'm lucky i can somehow always luckily fit all the words in right. and it's like it's it's almost like he would try to maintain a state of not Fully planning out how he's going to fit all the words in. Yeah, but definitely and it would just sometimes work out. he was doing. Yeah, yeah. But I've I've heard him doing it, and definitely it's like he's just staying in really fast at the end of the line. <laughs> <laughs> you might not be quite as lucky and, and as he's spinning on to the next line as well. You know what I mean? It's like okay, we still got some from the last line in this line now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I don't know. I don't know if it's magical, you know? <laughs> right. Well, you know, yeah, like, with all due respect. Yeah. As long as he experienced it that way, though, he was having fun, right? Yeah, fucking. Yeah. I mean, not? if you yeah, tell yeah, yourself yeah. you're magical, well, and there is how much, something how much... that's like really powerful about the very moment of creation. I mean, I think that sometimes, as performance-wise, I've been, you know, writing a new song, and sometimes the very first time I get the song done all the way through it's a performance that's going to be as good as any of it's going to be as good or better than any other time that I do it. You know, I know. And then you're like, why wasn't I recording at that moment? Right. Or maybe you were, but you it's know. also a thing that, you know, uh, actors do it film, certain film actors will work with where get to the point where they just barely know the lines. So they have to kind of be concentrating in a way in that way that when you say anything, you're always kind of thinking of something else, which mm. is always a mark of a good actor. Is or that trying to plan what you're saying. Yeah, you're planning what you're saying, you're choosing your words, or you're actually thinking about fishing and you're trying to <laughs> get this one, you know, get the woman to fall in love with you, but or whatever it is, you know, but the, the two competing impulses is, is what makes a lot of good performances for actors. I think it can be a little bit similar with uh, vocalists. Right. Yeah, I think that is true. I tr there were all those songs that I like half finished and then I wanted to come back to them. Yeah. And I was like, no, there's no. They were, they're actually finished now. Yeah. Because I'm never going to be able to, actually, I, I'm not there anymore. And Right. Uh, and totally I guess whatever like I did then is done because I yeah. can't, I can't, yeah. what, am I going to re-sing that it, fucking song? There's no way. I barely have a single song that I've written in more than one sitting. 
Like late, lately, I've started writing songs over the course of maybe two or three days. But if they don't get locked in, and I'll still tweak them, but if they're not locked in, then they're just they're just they're just half little. They're like little tadpoles. Yeah, I mean, I find with lyrics, if I'm if I do it, I mean, it took me quite a while to realize it, but it was like if I didn't kind of get the you know at least a sketch of the whole song lyrically done in one in one sitting. Yeah, it was just. I'm never going to go back in the same, it's never going to be the same song. Yeah. Go back to it. You know, so I, I used to always end up with these things where the first verse and the second verse were like, these don't really belong together. You know, mm. it's like something in, something in my frame of mind has changed between the two and it's just like, it's not the same thing anymore. It's yeah. Not the same person really, you know. I yeah. have the song, yeah, yeah. I have that song, you know, I showed it to both of you guys that I thought was going to be one of the best things I ever did. That song, Me Time. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's a great song. Yeah. But I never wrote the second verse, and I now I can't. I feel like I can't. Yeah. Too, and I thought it was like late. I thought it was like such an awesome like I have fallen in love with every woman I've met. I felt like it was the most awesome opening line that I've ever written. Yeah. You know, that's, like, a, that's <laughs> a great line. <laughs> <laughs> but like, uh. but then like I couldn't since I didn't write that second verse. Like it's just never got written. And right. now I feel like I can't ever finish. Like I would like to put that song out into the world. Send it to me. I'll take a crack at it. <laughs> All right, Seriously, I'm, I'll see if I can't give it a second verse. You don't have to, I won't be offended if you don't use it. Sure, Christmas song style. Yeah. been writing then what well, i can't sorry what were you say oh i was gonna say that um i talking about the talking about what you said don dom is the um i'm not a huge jack kerouac fan but there's a great uh quote or there's a great thing where he laid out like his philosophy and writing and he talks about basically you have the this diamond center and you hold on to the diamond center and then you just write around that thing and i feel in songwriting it's 
it's apropos like that that actually works because if it's just this inarticulate idea and you just focus on that inarticulate idea it kind of keeps the um um it keeps the verses together but it's almost a med it's like a meditative state more than any kind of intellectualizing and that's why if you leave the meditative state it's it's almost impossible to get back into it right mm. yeah it's like a specific spot isn't it like it's yeah a specific location of some kind yeah totally because it's like even if it's supposedly the same subject it's it's very strange how you know just how yeah no i totally get that because it's not even something like a subject or something doesn't really capture what it is right <laughs> it's right. something else isn't it which is like it's almost like a position or a, a, you know or a, a, a location in everything you're never going to find that in like 4D again, you know, that exact precise point <laughs> right. where you were, you know, so, and somehow you can just tell. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if anyone else can, but you know, but you can tell. No, yeah, you, hear they the, can. you can hear the, as the author of it, you can hear the false notes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone else can too, though. <clears throat> I mean, I think that yeah. when... <laughs> <laughs> Shit. When, no, because people don't hear a lot of the stuff we think they hear very much little mistakes this and that people aren't nearly as as tuned into that as you think but if right. you lose the thread right. everyone can hear that yeah i think you're right i think you're right <clears throat> because it doesn't hold does it doesn't no hold, so <clears throat> yeah. yeah yeah well on that note should we what, what you've been working on mike can we play something yeah. of yours you got something yeah. unreleased maybe yeah sure thing i've got a bunch of new songs i I hadn't really written a song in about two years because uh, I've been so focused in writing my book and like getting that done. And oh yeah, we got to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah I'd love to talk yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> um, and that and now now I'm still working on that, but I have periods away from that where I don't have to work on it. <clears throat> um, and just kind of all the alone time that I've been experiencing too, and being in nature and shit. I've been incredibly fortunate because I've been able to really just. Uh, I, for the first time in my life, I have, um, uh, seriously, I have like an income that I'm okay with where I don't have to stress about finances all the time, which I know is the opposite of what a lot of people are going through right now. Right. Um, but um, so I'm super grateful for that. And it's, it's amazing how much it's opened up my fucking head. Like my antenna has felt really high for, for songs. Um, so I couldn't do it. I got my guitar here. I could, I could play stuff live. It's yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so this was one. This was, I think, the second song I wrote in quarantine, and it was kind of like, I mean, I mentioned country music and folk music, but I like all kinds of stuff, and kind of like this, I consider is like a fun, a little stupid, a little ditty. Um, but I was sort of meditating on and thinking about the choices I made because I'm single, and I'm like, you been, and I was like, basically here by myself. I'm like, there's not even a chance to go on a date. <laughs> I have to risk my life to do that. So I wrote this one. It's called Bachelor Millionaire. What do you do with a kiss when you've got no lips to press on? What fun is opening a gift when you're alone, you're alone, you're so what do I do with this checkerboard? There's no one here to king me, no queen to take my rook. I guess I'll open another book. I'm so alone, oh so alone. I've lived my life like a bachelor millionaire. Though I never had very much money, now I'm getting older, looking kind of funny. And I don't have a lover who cares for me. What do I do with this itch when there's no one here to scratch it? I got a broomstick in my hand. I rub my back against the door jam. I'm so alone, oh so alone. You see, I lived my life 
like a bachelor millionaire. Though I never had very much money, now I'm getting older, looking kind of funny. And I don't have a lover who cares for me. Now there's a deck of cards sitting on the counter. I could play solitaire. Eating beans every lunch and dinner. No one smells the care. What I would do just for a cuddle. What I would do for a kiss. When you're all alone, I tell you, Sonny, it's the little things that you miss. I lived my life like a bachelor millionaire Though I never had very much money Now I'm getting older, looking kind of funny And I don't have a lover who cares for me No, I don't have a woman who pair with me No, I don't have a buddy to share with me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's the power. That's the power of that Wicked kind of music, boy. <laughs> the good sad sack kind of Kind of gazer. It's also so just that, so great that whole thing of just being able to just pick up the guitar. You're like, oh, you want to hear a song? Boom. Right. Yeah, you know, like there's oh, no yeah, there's man. no obstacle. I mean that that's the that's what's so great about that form, right? No, oh, it is. It is. And that's and that's a lockdown one, yeah. Uh yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> a being alone one. <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> so how's it going then with the book tell us about the book man yeah <laughs> um so i had spent a uh, i spent a year working in north dakota working on oil rigs at the height of what was then called the bakken oil boom in 2013 and um i've written a memoir about my that year in my life at that that at this point now delves back into my childhood and my growing up and sort of my whole fucking experience about a per as a person. There's a lot in it actually uh, about music and about the guitar. Um, and, um, but mostly it focuses basically on this oil boom town that was like a gold rush town um, and sort of all the guys and the people that I met doing this incredibly dangerous job in a, in a town that was also pretty dangerous. So that's kind of like the short like, explanation of what it is. Wow. That's <clears throat> awesome. What, what was the town? Where, uh, where was it? Williston, North Dakota. So it's, it's in Northwest North Dakota. It's at like 40 miles from Montana and about 40 miles from Canada. And, and what makes that so dangerous? Like <clears throat> crime? Like, yeah. I mean, what happened with the boom is that it, the boom kind of started right around 2008, right after the, with the housing crisis and the collapse. <laughs> And so you had this town where there was a way to make a lot of money. The town had about 12,000 people in it in 2008. By the time I got there, it was about 50,000 people. Five zero? <laughs> yeah. Right. So it Five quint zero. quintupled, <laughs> right? Whoa. Yeah. And there wasn't enough housing for these people. And they're primarily, it was men who, you know, had, who had lost their jobs. So it was construction workers and roofers. And there's something happens for one thing when you have just that many men in one place and everybody's fucking hungry and there's not a place to stay. There's not a place to sleep. So I, people were sleeping in their vehicles. Um, I, I rented a mattress on the floor of a flop house <clears throat> for, um, I think for like $525 a month when I first got out there. Which and seems like a lot. That's a lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> for a mattress on the floor of a flop house yeah. in Northwestern yeah. North Dakota. That's not cheap. No, the, no the, the rent in yeah, the rent in North Dakota at that time had surpassed San Francisco and was the highest rent in the nation. And because it was wow. there's such a need for it. Um, and so then of course, so then you have all these men and all this money, and that gets followed by prostitutes, and that gets followed by organized crime. Um, the town mm -hmm. I was in, I you know, had like I mean, by the time I got there, they had the police department had kind of uh, beefed up. But, you know, there's a point where it was like one cop for every 200 miles. Wow. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you have a cop, if you have a police presence that's designed for 12,000 and it's, right. you're dealing with 50,000 and the new 
38,000 are all single guys. Right. <laughs> right. And another big factor was, was, that the, was that the oil companies were so uh, hard up to get workers and to get people who could work that they had a very um, a felon friendly hiring practice, which I think is a positive thing. I Family mean, friendly. Felon friendly. Oh, felon friendly. Yeah. So that's also uh, good. It's an important difference, though. It is. It is. It is. <laughs> but, but, and it led to Williston, North Dakota, having the highest concentration of sex offenders in the United States. Oh, shit. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah. So my buddy, a buddy of mine was staying in a trailer park, the Fox Run trailer park. And he said that they were doing um, like regular sweeps. Once a month, the cops would come in. And because the sex offenders are supposed to register and they'd come and they do sweeps in the trailer park. He was like, this place is fucking full of fun. <laughs> yeah, so it leads to a really tense. It just, and everywhere you go, everybody's talking about that all the time. Sort of the mythology of the place you know, the stories that you're hearing are really get, end up getting under your skin. I mean, I was constantly told, don't leave a drink unattended. Like, there are uh, people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, well, I mean, and, that's true. That's true, irrespective of sex offenders. Right. Yeah. I mean, no, I guess, you can get, you can get really, you can get really. <laughs> <no> <laughs> <reason>. <laughs> 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 the reason <laughs> was because they're like, people were like, they'll drug you and rape you. Like, that was the, that was the vibe. Oh. And, 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 you know, being told that that was happening. And I guess it's something that really like women have to do, have to consider a lot all of the, the time. time, all, all the time, even all and the time. Have, yeah. And, and, I, and I, I've, I've had more than one female friend who, who said that they had like where they, they made yeah. it out without anything bad happening, but they were clearly drunk. Yeah. You know, and it's like now people are much more aware of it, but. Right. But it's, it's scary. It'll put a little bit of a rabbit in your heart, just kind of knowing that that's what's going on. That's sort of the vibe. And but, so on top of that, and on top of what's happening in the town, the job itself is, it has uh, one of the like, highest fatality rates of any, of any job in the world. And so you get into, when they, when they start doing the figures, I can't ever remember them exactly, but um, there are periods of time where it was safer to be a, a combat soldier in Afghanistan than to work on an oil rig. <laughs> so that sounds terrifying. I mean, the, so the the people it's attracting are people who are willing to endure that kind of risk, right? Yeah, yeah, like and Mike. Yeah, like <laughs> Mike. <laughs> How did you find yourself there? I didn't yeah. ever think of you as a guy who was going to do that. Yeah, I mean, it. You know, in some ways, like the writing of the book is a ex is a sort of. You know, I thought when I started writing it that it was going to be about these guys that I met and this sort of experience that I saw. And as I wrote it more and more, I kept getting it. Well, you know, I was like my agent and then my editor were like, well, you're telling you're talking about this guy's experience, like growing up. Like, what about yours? And like, why? Like, why are you there? I kept getting that question. <laughs> And it's an incredible, it's an incredibly hard, it's taken me 370 pages to fucking answer that question. You would think that it would be easy. Um, but, you know, the truth is, at, at, or, or where I'm at with it now is, um, you know, I was living in, in Brooklyn, in New York, in Williamsburg. I had a great apartment. I had a really a pretty good job. And um, I had never experienced the level of comfort that I was experiencing while I was in, while I was there, and I'd never been in a situation um, where I wasn't worried about my finances and I didn't have something kind of like terrible weighing me down. I wasn't like running from anything, and it's really hard. It, I think what I've learned about myself is that basically I you know I grew up in an abusive household, and I grew up with this kind of heightened just shit where I like the heightened stuff. I like the stressful stuff. And in some ways, I mean, I really uh, subconsciously um, just sort of set my life on fire and went to do this fucking shit. And I thought I was going to make a shit ton of money too. So it was like, I was did, like, I'm going to go out there and make a shit ton of money. And then I'm going to have all this money and I'm going to buy stuff for like, I didn't even, I didn't even think ahead to like what I was going to do with all the money, but it was just this idea that I would then have money and that would give me some kind of fucking freedom um, to like, I mean, I think I was, I was like going to make a movie or something. It was just like, um, you know, it was just kind of what it was just, it was, it was abstract even to me when I was doing it. So um, it had nothing to do with writing a book initially. 
Um, yeah. th that was that was something too, and it's funny because when I depending who I talked to, so like who I was talking to about that I was going to do it, I gave many different answers, sort of depending on who I was talking to. <laughs> right. And there were people I said, "Look, I think I'm going to write a book," and I was I have written plays in the past, and I was writing short stories, and I was starting to feel like I was I'd be able to actually write a book. Um, but I was like, I'm not going to write a book about like dating chicks in fucking New York. You know, no, like, I mean, because why would you want to make a bunch of money and, and, and like write a thing that everybody wants to read? Right. right? Like, <laughs> don't you feel like, like a whole bunch of people like somehow made a career out of writing about the most banal fucking topics? Right. Like, oh, hey, I dated some chicks. They were hot. Some, some people managed to, to some people kind of managed to do it. I don't know if I'm that. Yeah, but it, you know, so so I was thinking a lot about writing, and um, and um, I just lost my train of thought. Oh shit! Sorry. No, oh, that's okay. Um, um the question was why it was like doing... another. There was another reason that was kind of floating in my consciousness just a minute ago. Um, but oh, it'll it'll, it'll it'll come back to me. Come on. Now I feel bad for you. <laughs> now I feel really guilty I, I, I for interrupting Mike when he was in the middle, you know, for me to make like a snarky comment about like, who interrupted him. It was you, wasn't it? It was Sarth. It was Sarth. <laughs> I'm, I'm oh, making I know what I was going to say. I know what I was going to say. Is that, you know, another thing about the way I, the way that I grew up was I grew up on a farm. And, and when I was a kid, um, I was obsessed with joining the military. I wanted more than anything to join the military. And uh, my plan when I started high school was basically I was gonna drop out when I was 16. Neither of my brothers had finished high school. And I was gonna just get a job at like a gas station. And then I was gonna join the army. I wanted to be an uh, army airborne ranger. And when I got into high school on like my first day, I took a drama class and there was a uh, teacher there who was, um, his name's Carl and he uh, it was his first day as a teacher and he came out and he was literally like the first sensitive man I'd ever met, like the first artist I'd ever met in my life. And, um, you know, and he really ended up changing my life. So I really he he kind of put we would he, he wrote music and he wrote plays and he acted and he built the sets himself with a hammer. You know, he was like, he's this really interesting guy. He also coached the baseball team. So he was just like he was he was a masculine guy who was also really, really super sensitive guy and wasn't afraid of that. And I had never experienced that. Um, and so that sort of put changed my life trajectory to this more artistic pursuits. But I think that there's something in me that I've always felt incredibly ashamed of, like my artistic side. Like it's something that I always feel in combat with mm. and this sort of like embarrassment about like, oh, I write little songs um, or, you know, or I, I like putting on like, like I've put that down in myself. And I think that one big motivation for me to do this was to a like reconnect with the type of people that I knew growing up, the farmer pe people or rural people, and then B to kind of like, n you know, knock out sort of what I perceived as like an artistic like weakness in myself. Mm. You know. Yeah. You know, I've it's definitely like, had I've definitely had similar things where like there's a little overcompensation, I guess I would say, with me sometimes, mm -hmm. or you know, because I've always been a sensitive even as a kid i was a sensitive kid you know and then there's like this desire to to make sure you're not becoming completely detached from the real world for me you know like not just wanting cred but also just wanting to make sure that you're not just becoming some sort of alien that has nothing to do with regular people you know right. <clears throat> yeah you know some, something i found interesting I, I remember a while back i started to read something by by hemingway <clears throat> And, and I thought it was really interesting that, um, you know, he has, had, has this kind of image of, you know, this kind of, you know, the shooting, drinking, you know, right. sort of the tough guy, guy and stuff. And I, I thought that his writing was going to be that. And I read it and I thought, shit, it's not. It's nah. very sensitive writing. Mm -hmm. You know, and, it, you know, 
so and that was real that was kind of wow that's really interesting Hemingway is one of the most sensitive most delicate writers that there has ever been and it's it's a funny thing how he is thought of as that way and he wrote about you know shit that was happening and the bullfighters and that kind of stuff but um, but his books struggle a lot with masculinity they struggle with it and in a really emotional like you know, you can see at times he seems like he doesn't even have any skin. I mean, he's such a craftsman. He's such a great craftsman. But um, I absolutely, I think he's he's uh, he's one of the most sensitive writers that I can even think of. Hemingway, we're still talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, there's like a, a demonstration. Oh, okay. Like, like crazy it, it wasn't them was just like... pretending to do a demonstration in the back. It's <laughs> <laughs> like throws a bottle at the back of your head, like. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing, and it's an interesting thing societally as far as like trying to figure out masculinity in this world, like a positive masculinity, because it's hard to, if you don't, you know, depending on. You know, if you have examples of that, that obviously helps a lot. But there is something about, you know, a world where, and this is a little bit of what my book gets into, is sort of a world where we're kind of so separated from the ability to do, like, good, meaningful work and how rare meaningful work has become. And I think that that's like, you know, that's a big part of everybody's identity. Um, and maybe, yeah. maybe more so for for and on this for men maybe more so I'm not sure but um, you know we're people being defined by their jobs and if your job is like I work at a Target you know and do customer service that's that can be pretty uh, that can shrink a person and I think that that becomes um, not that that's a terrible job but depending on the person right some people are equipped for that but. Um, but if, if if you're forced into kind of these super this super marginal existence where um you know you don't um uh, where you're just sort of so removed from any kind of meaning i think that that's where you get a lot of pro you get really problematic behavior mm. i i couldn't agree more i i i do want to push back a little bit because i've been i've been thinking about this idea for the past few years where like you know <clears throat> and without i, I don't want to get into it like a without getting into a conversation about capitalism is like one of the main arguments of like a market economy is anything you do actually that people will give you money for is meaningful even if you don't really understand exactly how it's fitting in so if you're like if you're helping people like you know try on shoes or like you know or you're just moving the spreadsheet from here to here you feel like what you're doing isn't meaningful you're, you're not you know, you're not saving lives. You're not giving people injections. You're not, you know, digging ditches. Right. But it's like, that's a failure of, of imagination. To, you, you don't understand how you're fitting in. Yeah. And, and, right. and, and we do have the ability as a culture and as a society to, to help people recognize the value of the work they're doing, even if it's not as glamorous or even if the 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 value of it isn't as obvious right yeah i don't i don't totally disagree with that i do think that it does get into a, a conversation about capitalism that is maybe just not what we want to <laughs> what we want to totally dive into but um i think that there's there's truth in that um you know, a buddy and mine were talking, this is in a similar vein of just like basically how all, everybody's on anxiety medicine now. So it's like all these people on anxiety medicine, but nobody knows how to like get food. So like, so basically like if you know how to like actual like hunt and fish and like gather herbs and know what to eat and that kind of thing that makes you feel sick that gives you security but if you're someone who basically just has to do some weird thing that you don't understand that gives you some a little bit of money and then you then take it to this <laughs> store where there's this stuff wrapped in plastic it's just like by definition it should be inducing anxiety right, in all right, of us and, the, and the issue with when with it's basically like the anti-anxiety medicine is a way to get people to kind of be okay with the fact that they're they're not we're not doing anything that our bio that our biology is basically telling us that we should be doing. Yeah, we're these helpless fucking idiots. <laughs> yeah. you know? But I, I guess like if we apart from you know unless we I mean I I I kind of agree with what you were saying, Seth, actually because I think if it's like if it's 
like how first of all how many how many jobs would you regard as meaningful i mean ex the exception of things like healthcare and things like i mean like a, an estate agent i don't know how many of them would regard them, their job as being meaningful although people need houses you know like to, to right. live in and stuff and it's like i mean so i can kind of i can pic picture a situation where where if everyone if everyone was only doing meaningful shit it'd probably be quite a bad mess wouldn't it but also all this shit wouldn't get done like you yeah, would go to the like store and there would be no store meaningful because shit, <laughs> 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 like, okay. people would be like no oh, i don't think like cleaning the streets that meaningful you're like but this exactly yeah, but also on the other hand, I do totally agree with what you're saying. But the thing is about oh, these medications and stuff. Yeah, it's the, it's the kind of it's the kind of num numb ourselves into acceptance, isn't it? Things. No, and I couldn't agree more yeah. with you, Mike. Yeah. That these are artificial environments. These are artificial tasks. They're mm -hmm. a very artificial way to schedule tasks. I mean, I think that um, it was a huge thing, and I think that you know, there's this notion. I don't know how historically accurate it is, but there's this notion that the that the word lunch like started in New York with the subways because prior to that, and we can lunch, we can look this up. Yes. We can look this it's up short for luncheon. Yes. But why were people it used to be, you have dinner in the middle of the day, like Spain style. But what was happening was when we put in the subways and you could start commuting. Now you're a little too far away from your house to go home in the middle of the day. Right. So people started taking like a lighter lunch in the middle of the day and then they would have their big meal at the end of the day hmm. i don't know how true that is but it's a good story and it does point to how this notion of oh now we wake up at a certain time and like have a quick breakfast and go and work for eight hours and then come home and eat a huge meal and then hang out for a minute and collapse i think we've all realized that that's that's totally not how we evolved right there's no way that that was the normal human schedule. Right. And like so many of the things that we're doing, even this conversation, right? It's, it's really fun, but it's not the same as, as being in a room where we can like smell each other and like look at each other out of the corner of our eyes. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of, of obstacles to us actually fully experiencing whatever we were built to experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, there are, there are more dimensions to it on there. But... All right, I have a couple things I want to play. Yeah. Yeah. I want to play... I want to play... A, so, sp speaking of current events, I have a song that I did seven years ago that I think is perfect for right now. Right. <laughs> Excellent. And the title is? Primary Defenestration. What is Defenestration? Oh, Windows. Is that... Mm -hmm. All right, so I mean, <laughs> what is defenestration? I don't know what that is. It's, it's, it's technically means to be thrown out of a window, but it also means oh, it's to, to do with windows. But yeah, it's also, but it also means to uh, like remove somebody from, like to to cancel them, basically. It's like an gotcha. old word for like to, to destroy their re reputation, throw them out of the of the tribe. Defenestration. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I want to hold on. hashtag primary defenestration. <laughs> but it's also I wrote this song it's about um, hashtag. about <laughs> <laughs> about a number of different things, including Amadou Diallo, which is some, somebody that everybody forgot about. <sighs>
brown and gray. That is wicked, man. <laughs> That's really cool, man. <laughs> that is so cool. Do you know what? I was just in the middle of that. I just started thinking, you know, about this, you know, the way how <clears throat> that weird thing of how, how we enjoy and can feel kind of good listening to music which reflects bad feelings <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i mean it's a strange thing we do that because i mean logically you think we'd always want to live to listen to stuff which is like we'll take our mood away from something but but that kind of right. thing of where even i mean listening to something is not really expressing yourself but there is that kind of there is that something pleasurable and something well i, I don't know why i find this so hard to articulate you know what i mean though and it's like when when you listen to something which goes with the mood you're in or the or the <laughs> situation you're in, and you think, why why wouldn't I want to why why am I feeling good listening to something which sounds dystopian and kind of <laughs> right? right. You know what I mean? But right. it's making me feel good, and I really want to listen to this right now. I actually don't know why that works. Yeah, like, I don't know that why work? that makes me feel better. Like when I'm mad and I listen to some angry music, why is like why do I like that? Like, yeah. wouldn't I want to listen to something that would calm me down? Exactly, that's what I mean. Right? Is it catharsis? Yeah, maybe. Is that like something? Uh, yeah, I guess. Or, I or, I, about it. or I thought, I, sometimes I feel yeah, like I it ma- lets me manifest. Like I, I'm feeling this thing, but I haven't been able to feel it as much as I want to feel it. Yeah, yeah. So I finally yeah. get like the satisfaction of really feeling it. And then right. it comes ah. catharsis, I think. So. Yes, yes. I saw, I, I, I've got a friend who kind of does, he kind of does uh, counseling of different kinds and he, he he was actually a rock you know a rock star like quite a successful rock star for a long time you know and uh he uh and then kind of now he does kind of counseling and he said one one thing he, he told me about was this thing of where you when you're in stress you know one way to deal with anger is like mentally to go into it rather than to try and kind of push it down so in your head you just kind of he would go through these things where you would say, like, for instance, like, what's the worst thing that could happen? What's worse than that? What's worse than that? What's the worst than that? So you go drive fast. It's like accelerating faster and deeper in your mind into the, into the darkness. And he goes, and by doing that, you kind of, in a way, it kind of ends up neutralizing it because you, rather than avoiding it, you kind of, you go into it to see what's in there. And usually it's, there's, you know, you hit a point where it becomes meaningless. I mean, there's a stoic thing like that uh, where you're supposed to spend time contemplating the worst thing you can think of so then you appreciate everything else more. Right. But it's also like a meditation thing where it's like your first observation is supposed to be, um, or at least like in the Sam Harris ones, you, it's not possible to, to sustain an emotion without constantly giving it effort. So as you become aware of that, you realize you can't stay mad without constantly feeding the anger. Yeah. But, but then the second a, thing you realize is that resisting the emotion does the same thing. It keeps giving you right. Away. So if you dive into it, but you don't hold on to it, hmm. then you can. Yeah. 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 yeah there's, there's like, a, it's kind of like a meditation or almost like a credo that I'm, that I've been adapting, you know, and in the, in writing uh, this book, like it led me to basically call up all my brothers and sisters and let's talk about like our worst memories growing up (laughs) (laughs) or like I'd send them pages and I'd say, well, listen, this is how I remember this thing going down. Like, how do you remember it? Wow. And, wow. Uh, oh, that's intense. That sounds intense. It's been yeah. really intense. And I've been doing that for like a year of kind of going back and forth. Cause, um, <clears throat> And uh, it's made me closer to all my siblings, but it's been, but it's pretty, it's been pretty tough. And, but kind of like when I decided to do that, um, it's also, it's led to a cool thing inside the book. And that when you get to the sections that are like about my family, I'll say like, well, my brother Ryan remembered it this way. I remembered it this way. And it kind of colors it. And so there, there are these moments where their voices are in the book, which I think is a really a beautiful thing. Um, but um, when I started on that process, I had kind of, I was actually, was in, I did an ayahuasca ceremony and I'd been thinking a lot about it and the fact that I wanted to do that. And I'd been thinking a lot about um, like the kind of the, the revelation that I had without going kind of too deep into the whole experience. Um, 
was very simple. It was just that if you, if, if something's in darkness, it's still there. You just can't see it. Yeah. So if you, if you shine a light on it, then it's still there, but you can navigate around it and you can right. know where it is and you can develop, you know, like develop a relationship with it instead of just having the thing you're scared of, uh, be not seen. Um, that's an amazing, you know, it's a beautiful way to put it really. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and it, that's the kind of concept that could let you screw up your courage and do something that, that you really don't want to do. Yeah. You know, I mean, it needs I, to be done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and I've been really trying to just stick with that and it, because everything is fucking scary. I mean, fear is the thing fear. We're all like fear rules us in so many ways. And if, if you can just kind of accept that fear that you're afraid of at all, <laughs> things are a little bit, it makes it a little easier to do it. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. But that felt like a real, a real revelation to me that I've been kind of working on for a long time. And I think that that goes back to what you were saying, Dom, about like if you move into the anger, if you move into the dark emotion, well, then you can see the parts. You can see what it's made of. And you can realize, oh, I'm actually not mad. I'm just fucking super sad about this one thing, you know, or I, or I really feel way too vulnerable in this situation. I'm disappointed or I'm mad about this one thing. Right. I don't hate the world. I'm actually just mad about this one thing. Right. Like, and, it's, right. and it's okay. Like, right. that was legitimately a thing I should be pissed off about, but it's not, you know, yeah. 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 The other thing is, is we, there's something, I can't remember who said it, but it's something that made me think this, this thing as well, like this kind of um, things like sulking. I mean, that's a really weird emotion, isn't it? Because it's something that we voluntarily, voluntarily hold on to. Right. We we actively do it. <laughs> right. No, the pleasure yeah. of being sad. You know, yeah. there it's is this kind of in a rich pleasure. <laughs> yeah. And, and we know we know we do it and we know yeah. what an asshole someone else looks like when they're doing it. <laughs> so we know by that that we must also be an asshole when we're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like and then it's it's a but it's a tough one to get out of. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean I could be stuck. But I mean, the meditating, like that's those Sam Harris meditations that I started like a little over a year ago, and I've never done that consistently. But I think I did like at one point, I think I might have done like 45 days in a row or something, you know? Oh, yeah. 10 minutes. But I've done, when I look at the total number of hours, I'm shocked, you know? But realizing it was a choice to hold on to something like that, I'm not saying that I'm there, but some percentage of the time, I just cut it out. Right. I'm just like, yeah, you know right. what? Like, I'm not going to just keep sulking. This is ridiculous. <laughs> actually, <I'm> just... <laughs> this is way too I'm going to enjoy just like five to ten minutes of sulking. <laughs> and then I'm going to go do something else. Yeah, it's like be... rationing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, part of the thing I've been getting into it lately. It could be dangerous to cut it out altogether at once. Right, right. Right. <laughs> right. So, you know, I've been into like losing my temper in the form of being really mad and walking away and thinking about it for five minutes and then just not. So I'm still losing my temper in my mind, but it doesn't involve like yelling and it doesn't involve hyper committing to a position. Right. So like in my mind, like it's still, I'm losing my temper. Because I've seen you hyper commit to a position. So. And uh, sometimes it ain't always so pretty. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> so um with the like you mentioned the ayahuasca then so have you is that something you um has that kind of had i suppose has that played into your like art at all at any time is it or, i mean in yeah a, in, i mean in a kind of direct that... way I think that that um, I've only done ayahuasca that one time and I was actually had a set. I was going to do a second ceremony right when I had fled New York. Mm. So I wasn't able to do that second ceremony. Um, but that, that revelation um, I feel like has, has really stuck with me and is in, it has, yeah, that's really stuck with me. Um, and then I do, you know, I actually did, 
uh, a bunch of psychedelics this past weekend. I ate a bunch of mushrooms, and I was at the uh, went to the Daniel Boone National Forest, which is down here, the Red River Gorge, and it's some of the most beautiful hiking that I've ever seen in my life. The ecology in Kentucky, I had no idea like how vast it was. In some instances, like every 300 yards, it's almost like a completely different ecological system. Wow. It's really, really profound, um, even without the, uh, the psychedelics, which I was taking off and on at different days. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you, baby. I'm coming. I'll, I'll be <laughs> <Yeah>. there next week. <laughs> Come down, seriously, I'm, yeah, man. I'm eating you there. I'm serious. But <laughs> yeah. My uncle lives, what, how many miles from you? Madisonville. Oh, awesome. Yeah. 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 I just got a bunch of books on um, like identifying yeah, trees and identifying edible plants and medicinal plants. So I'm really, I really plan to dive into that stuff. I think it's really exciting to me. Um, and I don't think so with, I do find psychedelics to help me kind of clean out my, and sort of clean out the, some of the junk in my brain and sharpen my purpose. I think that, you know, if you're at a party drinking some beers and you take some mushrooms with a bunch of strangers, that sounds not fun to me. Um, but taking a hike through the woods when I really have my kind of my intention set um, and I'm, I'm really kind of, you know, sharpening some sense of something or, 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 ask, or searching a little bit, I think it just, you know, it's, it's the same thing as like prolonged meditation. I feel like it gets me a bit to the same place. And I also med, I also meditate not every day, but I have a strong meditation practice. Um, when you meditate, how long do you meditate for? For about 20 to 40 minutes. That's cool. Yeah. I do. There's a guy, Montak Chia, who has the universal Tao system. I use his system when I meditate. That's good stuff. Yeah. Montak Chia. Yeah. Montak Chia. Montak Chia. That makes me want to play that track that you and I worked on together. Oh, yeah. How about if I play, do you want me to play, the, I want to play the original one. Or do you want to hear like the our, our end version? I want to kind of want to hear the original one before we did everything. The original one. I, I feel like we should hear the end. I mean, if you want to play both of them, I could listen to both of them. The, you mean the one that's just me and the guitar? With all my crazy processing, though. Right. I mean, don't just. <laughs> right, right. But the but the, I the, dispute that this version would be considered by anybody but you as just you and the guitar. Okay, I just don't, I don't know what version you're talking. about Okay, I'll just play it, and if we don't like it, we'll play something else because we're gonna edit this. By the way, this is in the live stream. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I would like to hear. I haven't listened to the uh, finished version in some time, so it's been. So a Dom, for context, we actually thought we were gonna do at least three songs this way, but we did uh -huh. one. Right. But you did it like twenty different ways, yeah. <laughs> no, we actually we, didn't. We, we actually we, we, we didn't. We have a whole thing where we were like, no, 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 going back. It, actually, it was one of the nicest working experiences I've ever had. We had basically no disagreements. Right. We didn't obsess over anything. Nice. I was like, if only every musical collaboration I'd experienced was like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We decided not to nitpick too much and just to basically focus on a few sounds and get those sounds down. And we took the lyrics to there's a folk song. And I basically rearranged the lyrics and adjusted the lyrics. So I'm the an Irish, skeleton of this folk tune. Is an Irish folk tune called Down in the Willow Garden, right? Right, yeah. Down in the those. Willow Garden. And I think that, yeah. so this was the first night. So this is going to be like the more experimental sounding one because it's basically just Mike's original recording with me just processing shit. Mm -hmm. Great. Courting my love 
fell off to sleep I had a bottle of burgundy wine My love, she did not know There I poisoned the dear little girl down under Fuck. <laughs> That's cool. The other one has a completely different set of lyrics. I had it. Yeah, I know. I forgot that until just. <laughs> yeah. Should, but should you know the other one as well? Yeah, yeah we, should, we, we should. should listen to the it's other actually one. That fun. was amazing. Honestly, I was like, I, my eyes were welling up at one point. Yeah. I was just, I was really you lost know, in that. that I got to like, hand it to Deborah. Deborah kept encouraging me to not sleep on that version. Like when we first mm. did it. Because I was like, this is just a rough draft. You know, because you know, we did that in three hours. You know, right, right. and it's beautiful. And it's Mike, you like, know, we all had yeah. a lot of attentions, you know, but Deborah kept being like, don't, I mean, don't I don't know. No, no, she's like, do what you got to do, oh, you right. know, yeah, but just but so you know, I like this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other something that we captured on that, it's so haunting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So now I got to figure out what the, so Mike, I think that you probably know for sure. I don't want to play the wrong one. Right. Right. So if I like, you have it in your play in your email, right? Um. Bu- 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 so then, Mike, uh, he re- he re- rewrote the lyrics. He recorded uh, additional guitar. Then we did a whole bunch of continuum fingerboard tracks. And right. then we did like a whole cut down of editing. And the one we just heard. What do you say? The one we just heard. The version Starting from heard. that one. That's what right, we did right, after right. that. Right. So we ended I up loved with... them. Like, I mean, the, the whole yeah, mix of like the, the really kind of 
washed out guitars and the and the the, the synth sounds you're doing and the and the vocals they're just like it just you know it was just it so was like a not- real uh you know scene there you know so mike i have one called version six new lyrics is that probably about as is that going to be the final one probably i think i have the final one here yeah i mean so i mean to mike's credit like he totally approached me being like listen man we're, we're always trying to collaborate but like we're coming from s- such different worlds i have an idea what if i have a couple songs most of them are covers where I don't feel like I'm, I need to be precious about them. Mm. Um, right. And I can let you do your thing. But I'm just going to, yeah. I'm going to like, I'm going to do justice to this song. Yeah. But if it was like maybe one of the songs that he'd just written like last week, he might feel like I want it to go a certain way. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I, John, I think you should, You guys should do more of them. I think you should do like an EP or something like that for sure. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, we should. It sounds fucking good. It sounds great. <laughs> I, mean, I, just, I haven't it's heard that thing a, in months and I love it. And you know uh, what? It's, it has, there's that kind of, like you're saying, cause, you know, because obviously you're saying you, you, no one was being precious about it and you just got that really, you know, and there's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, I don't know if it's partly because of that, but it's got just that kind of, you know, that kind of energy thing sometimes just have where it's just like, fuck, that just, that's just great. You know, it's just what there is to it, you know? Yeah. So I think yeah. we should definitely do more of them. Thanks. All right, let's hear what, where it ended up after uh, Mike led us a little bit to it.
Wicked. Hey, Mike, you have a lot of good ideas about mixing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was actually, I was, I was like, I was listening to that. I was like, oh, all right, that was Mike's idea. That was Mike's idea. Was Mike's idea. <laughs> <laughs> I like the mix. I feel like the vocals could come up just a touch. Oh, yeah, yeah. I felt like they were getting a little lost. Yeah. Some great delivery there. I think there's a certain point where we both looked at each other and we were like, is that what you just did? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I remember with those lyrics, I really wanted to, like, I love the old folk form. And so you take this sort of murder ballad. I mean, the, that whole song, Rose Connolly, is basically based on, or Down in the Willow Garden, is just like, I murdered a girl. And that's it. Like, that's it. Like, that's the whole song. <laughs> that's the whole fucking song. <laughs> and it has kind of this, like, there's an evilness that runs through it. And there's also, like, witchcraft in it. It seems mm -hmm. to me it feels ancient and feels, like, connected with sort of pagan ritual stuff, which I think a lot of those songs really are. They're about ritual killings and, and, and sex cults and shit. Like, that's kind of woven in the fabric of that. So, and, like, accessing some kind of energy. Yeah. That yeah. exists. Yeah. So, yeah. So I was pretty happy. That's, the, yeah. Those lyrics are pretty fucking hard. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, however hard the original was, you made it a little harder. <laughs> no. what, what did you think, Dom, about the difference between the two of them? What, did you have, do you prefer one or the other? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's hard to say because obviously by the time you second listen to the second one, you've lost the element of surprise. Yeah, right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. 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 So so it's kind of I don't know. It's um, it's probably a little unfair to to judge in that not judge, but you know, say which one. I I had a stronger reaction to the first one, mm -hmm. but I heard the first one first as well. So uh, it's yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that's no, fair. Uh, so, uh, but I, I, I mean, I thought they both they both sounded great. It's uh, the first one. I, I think just sort of I don't know for me, maybe it was just weirder. And there's something about the weirdness I liked. You know, yeah. I think yeah. that the first one's the first one's more punk rock, and it's more punk rock in like that kind of velvet underground kind of way. Yeah, like, or even suicide. It's got that kind of darkness yeah. that like suicide have as well. Yeah. And maybe that's Did, maybe that's, that's and I think that, like, coming out. Yeah, like, and I think that's what Deborah was reacting to. It's yeah. like that sort of you know, I'm a guy who when my a friend of mine first brought the velvet underground tape over to my house a tape. Yeah. Know, and I said, like, and I said, I said, never play that in my house ever again. <laughs> like, like, so I, so I get like not appreciating that ethos because I definitely would like I lived in that headspace for it, whatever yeah. a decade or something. Right. But like once you get into that ethos, then you kind of start to look for the things that feel a little yeah. awkward, a little the timing's a little weird, and the, and the mix is is like this, and it feels very like raw, and you know. The second one is starting to feel more composed and more. The second one, right. the second one, it made me think more. It was more in the so yeah. If the first one is the Velvets one or whatever, then I'd say the second one was in the. It was almost like the kind of lushness with like a kind of uh, Nancy Sinatra and Lee what's his face. <laughs> yeah, Lee Hazelwood. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which That's I it. also love. So it's like so yeah. It's, it's not a, I didn't, it's have, not a, I didn't have a favorite also. between the two just now. <laughs> I haven't yeah. listened to them in, in years. I mean, not but to years, be honest, but like, I'm not hearing them very well. Here. It's oh like really it's not thing. streaming yeah, well i i would i would want i would want to you know review right uh, <laughs> on an adequate uh, system in order to give my final appraisal <laughs> sounds good hey, by the hey, way i've got a question i want to ask which is like you do that i'm going to run to use the restroom oh, okay all right so how would you define americana as a genre musically uh, I don't know. I mean, I really don't. That's like one of those. That's like one of those word of genres that it's it. If it that I'm not crazy about the word, but I'm not offended by it either. Right, you know, right. like I'm not like ah. But um, it's often, I guess, just used to dis to describe stuff I don't like very much. <laughs> right, right. But then there's also just like I would describe that as Americana. Um, you know, it comes. I guess for me, it's the traditions are interesting, like the folk tradition. So that is like a ballad that would have come from like a Scott Irish ballad that was prop that was sort of originated in Ireland and England, and then settled into Appalachia, mm -hmm. and and came into contact with um, 
you know, with Native Americans and, uh, and black folks. And that's kind of how that, like, that's the story of that song. And I'm always interested in how those songs travel geographically and also like how they, um, how they, how they morph and shift and, and change. Yeah, right. You know? Right. Actually, it's interesting. Something you said that that last point you made is interesting because I, I did a I did a piece uh, a couple of years ago. I, I've made a few of these kind of like radio pieces. They, I call them kind of sound movies where they. You know, uh -huh. And I don't think I've ever played you any of them, but the I made one based on Little Red Riding Hood and like various mm. retellings of Little Red Riding Hood. Going so it, it was in French, German, and English. There was like the early earliest french version the charles perrault version there was the the brothers Grimm, you know uh, uh, -huh. uh rock kipchin and there was various other things various different other texts and stuff uh including like feminist texts and, and and stuff going to the 20th century and all sorts of stuff and and the the hammer of the hammer of witches you know that which was the the text that the witch finders basically used for like the witch trials in the middle ages was all based on this text called the hammer of witches oh really oh it's terrifying man you, you'd love I, it i bet i would <laughs> you would you would man you have to check it out it's called it's called malleus maleficarum huh and it was written by a German guy called Kramer, who basically he got he got a, like an official thing. It was called a, a papal bull. Like the it was like a, a, basically a, an authorization from the Pope, right. Pope Innocent or something or other. Anyway, the the thing which was interesting for me about it was exactly the same thing. I, I tried to in in the piece. I just I tried to make it like because uh, it kind of travels through time, you know. So you know, so you got you got. Yeah, from the Middle Ages through to the modern day and stuff, and and I'd read something to do with the survival of fairy tales and and how they kind of how they transform and they morph through time right. and, and through space. So I kind of tried to approach this this fairy tale as in a way being a um, almost like a virus or a bacteria or something, something which would just kind of mutate and change as it went through, you know, as it, yeah as it moves. So yeah. what you just said there kind of reminded me of that, you know, what you're saying with these kind of folk yeah, tales, I think folk of songs um, yeah, I mean, I almost think of um, a certain level of sentience in that fairy tales and that songs, that melody, um, and that even scraps of lyrics have. You know, I I've been really like I've been thinking a lot about sort of the reenchantment of the world. And, and the re, um, you know, the um, magic in the world versus kind of the science of the world. And, and, and for me, and I've been coming to a place where I've been getting more and more interested in animism and this idea that, well, animals have souls, trees have souls, rocks have souls, we have souls. And also even words and ideas have souls, which I think is a really profound way of looking at things i'm just starting to really practice it but i think that when it comes to those old folk songs i feel like the, there's a sentience in the melody in some cases and there's something written in, in in the root of those fairy tales like they were either you know they were concocted by by pagan rituals and they were these ritualized tellings um and that there's magic inherent in that i think and i think i can feel the same thing when you hear a really like good rendition of a song, you know? So one difference, I think when I talk about folk songs, like there's folk songs and then there's like pop songs. If we just make those two categories a, a pop song or a rock and roll song or whatever is someone singing to like express their own feelings basically. So the song is in service of the singer. You write the song to tell your story and then you tell the story with, with a folk song it's inverted where the meaning is the song. And so just as a teller of it, the focus of it is the song and that the chain, when they tell, when you talk about sort of the link, the links of the chain in folk music, it's sort of like, the song is the is the thing that's 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 moving and the singer is in the way like the praiser or the messenger for the song as opposed to the song being the messenger for the person yeah he's a vessel yeah 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 and that's that's something i really 
I, I spend a weird amount of time thinking about, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I think that there's real power there. I think that there's real fucking, that there is real magic in the world. And, mm -hmm. and something that I've been considering more and more is sort of the times that uh, I've experienced magic and then being taught to kind of um, basically ignore it, you know? Yeah, I, you know, I felt that very much because I think that when I was quite young, I was less skeptical. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt very in touch with, with magical experiences. And a lot of my, uh, a lot of my decision making was based on that. And yeah, so much of my reality was based on that. And then at a certain point, I think I, I decided to try out the, uh, the practical scientific materialistic <clears throat> view right. and it, and i actually have come to to thinking that regardless of what the true nature of reality is i'm not sure that the scientific material materialistic view is the practical one like right. it doesn't work that well for me to to, to engage with the world that way it's definitely I, banging up against a lot of stuff right now <laughs> where it's right. just like oh the materialism this scientific materialism doesn't fucking work and right. by the way, if you take a clump of soil, there's a million things in there that science cannot explain at right. all. And, yeah, and, yes, and, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a cheap approximation of things which which exist. Yeah, you know, yeah, just because they exist, or an expensive approximation. <laughs> that too. True. Well, it's True. tied up. It is tied up in money. It is tied yeah. up in money. A purchasable yeah. approximation. Yeah. I always think of the end of Lord of the Rings when like Gandalf gets on the gets on the boat with the elves. And he's basically just like, he's like, magic is ending because humans have showed up and they're fucking everything up. <laughs> he's just like, the industrial revolution's on the way. So, peace the fuck out. I'm taking Frodo and we're going to hang with the elves.
smells of earth. smoothness gently test out my cheeks the breath is so hot she nuzzles she spits my red cap from the bed. Some psalmists. Oh, yes. It's all true. Well, what was the term you? What did you call it? A re magic? A, a re enchantment. Yeah, a re enchantment. Ah, oh, yeah. yeah. That's gonna be the title of this podcast. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. into it. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. know what? I, st I, uh, like a few months back i kind of uh i was introduced to um some of the ideas of uh you know you know the film director and artist uh yudorovsky yeah yeah right so he, he, have you seen that is it is it the holy mountain or magic mountain i can't remember what the, that move 60s movie is called that he made I don't say holy mountain. I, th I think it's Holy Mountain, yeah. yeah. And it Santa was like, Sangre, that's one of his. That's one of his, yeah, with yeah. the arms or no arms. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's so, so weird. So, so South, I mean, Yorosky is basically this kind of this, this, I think he's Argentinian, isn't he? I think. I'm not sure. Oh. Anyway, he's, 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 he's a filmmaker and a theatre maker and, and does a lot of different things. And, uh, and he, um, he made this, this movie, you know, in the sixties, I guess, Holy Mountain, which was basically in the in the era of MGMT, you know, their videos and basically the whole kind of vibe that went on for about six months was all based on the Holy Mountain. It was like everyone was just basically ripping off this one movie to make all their pop videos. You know, for like <laughs> half a year. You know, it's like, 
So huh. you'll you'll see it and you'll be like, I recognize this because they <laughs> But yeah, uh, anyway, he does he's got a thing he calls psycho magic. And what he did, I started reading one of his books and he uh he went to study with a uh a witch in Mexico City uh for several years. And um similar to Carlos Casanata similar kind of thing but what 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 he said was this i, I mean he knows he knows custom because they obviously cross paths and stuff you know um the thing he said about this was because he comes from a, you know kind of uh you know uh metropolitan kind of cultured family you know that, and basically went to some you know this kind of poor area of mexico city or i can't remember if it was even mexico city or if it was somewhere rural anyway he said basically he was watching this witch thing and he said and at some point he says the thing is this right he goes i can't believe in magic the same way these people believe in magic he goes it's just it can't happen because i haven't been brought up that way you know mm. i haven't been born into it in, in, into something with that absolute no question kind of thing and it's it's kind of interesting because he has this little conversation with himself because the, the the witch she's kind of doing things which they are they are theater you know she's somehow making it look like guts are getting pulled out of people from under a sheet but this stuff has come from a butcher's that day you know it's like although she does it brilliantly uh, you know, right a, a, a kind of performative skill is incredible however people get better you know regardless even though those aren't really their guts he said you know people are really getting better so what he ended up doing, he, he came up with this idea of a thing which he calls psycho magic. And what he's saying is essentially just it boils down to this, that the soul, the language of the soul is symbolism and that you can cure things, with it, but it won't work with words. It works with symbols. The soul doesn't understand words. It understands symbols. And so that, which I think ties into what you were saying about you talking about the sentence and the words and the power and the words, which somehow almost perform like spells, you know, kind of, if, if that's what you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it's a similar kind of thing. And I, f I find that really interesting as well. You know, what the, 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 this, you know, plus he also designed a beautiful set of tarot cards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I, I love me some tarot cards. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And and for years apparently he used to do readings in a cafe in Paris, which I, I tried to find the last time I was over there, but yeah. it, it closed down. I just want the card <laughs> I just want the cards, man. Yeah, well you can get them, man. Just look, look I, at I have this Thoth deck, you know, that's like it's really big. It's like very hard to shuffle. It, it actually hurts my fingers to shuffle it too much. Like uh -huh. My hands aren't quite big enough. Yeah. And I definitely think there's there's weird magic in that deck. If right. anything is magical, yeah. that freaking Thoth deck. And I remember one day I was like, I was on the on the train. So, so when, you might want to get a bit closer to the mic. One day I was I was on the train. I was I was pretty young, and I was on the train, um, shuffling that thing. And like a woman came up to me and started interacting with me, and like weird stuff started happening. And I got home, and my girlfriend was like, she'd given it to me as a as a gift. She's like, don't don't do that, don't don't shuffle that that deck on the train oh yeah you have no idea what you're attracting to yourself going through right. the yeah. sub subway shuffling this thought deck. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, i've had a i am i'm hesitant about any kind of predictive magic so i've had experiences with the with the tarot deck when i was in my early 20s someone did a reading for me that was so bizarrely spot on and we were doing readings all the time and I found it was affecting my behavior. And that basically I was changing my behavior based on what the cards were telling me that I was going to do. Right, yeah, and then I got yeah. this one reading that was so super specific that I, I was like, I don't think the predictive stuff makes me uncomfortable. We have a mutual friend who, who, um, who does tarot readings or used to. Yeah. And she did one for me that was like that. Yeah. I, I started like laughing hysterically in the middle of the reading. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And I was just like, no. Right. Yeah, I don't believe in these things as predictive. I like the idea of it being sort of uh, expositive, like like mm -hmm. surfacing things that you need to know about. But the right. notion of it predicting the future, uh, that's I don't want to go there. No. Yeah, and I'm sure it depends on the reader. There are probably people who read it who don't who are who don't try to do predictive stuff. <clears throat> but going back a little bit to what you were saying, Dom. I mean, one thing about the when I did the ayahuasca ceremony was the ritual aspect of it was 
all was the theater and ritual aspect of it was as important as the medicine. And I, I even felt like, well, I don't even need the medicine, <laughs> but we can just do these ceremonies and to be in a ceremony and really rooted in a group of people. Is, it was a, that by itself was a really powerful experience. And, right. you know, being somebody who loves theater and has done theater as, you know, as much as had, for years, that was the cornerstone of my life, you know? So I'm always, so I was really drawn to that that aspect of it too right yeah i mean i did i did uh peyote in bolivia like uh i've never done peyote yeah i've never done peyote either (laughs) well i i mean i thought it i mean i only did it once and it was but it was that was a like a a really profound experience for me you know yeah uh, and i didn't there was no kind of ritual thing done it was literally i got got into a small town in 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 bolivia and it was i heard i found out from someone i was talking to that there was a guy there that could you know like did a kind of peyote preparation or could kind of da, 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 da. ended up finding this guy because they said it's a german guy and then i was in a bar and there was a german guy and i thought this has got to be the german guy <laughs> in small town in bolivia <laughs> anyway so he had a he had a friend who was supposed supposedly a shaman and da 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 and ended up getting this stuff which was like you know ended up like consuming pondweed basically you know and uh went up into the hills with my girlfriend at the time and three uh kiwis and we went up to the we went up to this 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 plateau and uh and then this whole thing kind of unfolded you know and i I remember going up the i was climbing up this uh this rock face i'm sure i've told you this one south this story no nope anyway well this 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 guy is kind of uh, like a a souvenir from that which is uh, i don't know if you can see that it's like a thing i oh yeah true all right so basically i i kind of I got into climbing, yeah, you know, and I just wanted to climb up this rock face, and get. I was going higher and higher, and I kept going up, and I would come back down a bit, and I go a bit higher, and I would come back down a bit, and I kept, you know, I kept on thinking, am I just like off my face, and I'm just gonna fall off the, you know, fall off the 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 mountain, you know, in a second, you know, it's like, but I kind of and, but I kept kept doing it, and then at some point, I just thought it suddenly became really clear to me. It was like the whole thing suddenly. Uh, presented itself as like an invitation to participate it was like the uh, like a cosmic invitation to participate you know it's like do you want to join in <laughs> you know and and the, and the whole thing had just was just a yes or no answer it was just like yes or no and so obviously he went yes and then i thought fuck it i'm climbing so i climbed all the way to the top of this thing and i thought i'm gonna watch the sun go down over lake titicaca you know so i, I got to the top and then there was a small kind of cave that had a, a little, almost like a window in it. So I kind of ended up asking for permission to go into this thing because I felt like something something lived there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> it just, seemed, just seemed polite, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 you do so have I asked, to. Yeah, exactly. And no, no one said no, so I went in. So I, <laughs> and, then, and then I watched the sun go down. And then, and then things got interesting because I was basically up a fairly sheer rock face uh, with no light. You know, only the moonlight to get back down again, and that was a, that was a trick getting down. I, you know, and yeah. I basically I had to actually follow my girlfriend's voice because the other three people fucked off and left us up there. Like they left, and they t- even said to her, "Why don't you come with us?" <laughs> and, she was like, <laughs> and luckily, uh, she was a good, decent great human friends being. with friends yeah, like great, those, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thanks, so, like, Kiwis. Look, yeah thanks, Kiwis. <laughs> so anyway luckily she she wasn't like them and she stuck around and i followed you know i followed her voice down the mountain and then i got down there and then we it's like finally we've done it but we hadn't done it because we were just back at this plateau which was surrounded by dried up waterfalls there were about four of them went off the sides of it we did not remember which one we'd climbed up so this is like in the dark and we're thinking one of these could just fucking go down a ravine you know what i mean we don't know so we're trying to kind of like edge down the thing and try and see over anyway finally we we picked the right one got down then we thought there was a monster that turned out to be a donkey that really freaked us out <laughs> but that's better actually than, that's better actually, than a donkey that turns out to be a monster yeah, yeah i yeah, mean yeah. that's actually like, that's like the, that's the least terrifying part of your story yeah. yeah well then then we got in we got in a, a colectivo like a little uh van taxi yeah i remember with, those yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, right. So, and uh, we got back into the town. It was the Inca Ray Festival was going on. So you had all these, <laughs> you know, kind of uh, Andean folk kind of really drunk, like on Pisco. They'd been like, you know, I, I, someone told me there's a rule they don't really drink that much there. And it was like, but once a year they go for it. And it was <laughs> carnage. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of cultures that have that. They're like, yeah. we don't ever do that except for when we do, which is right. like yeah, once yeah, yeah, or yeah, twice yeah. or three times a year. Yeah, but we got it. We got into the town. And we bumped into these sons of bitches that had left us up the thing. And the thing was, we were on fire. It was like the. I mean, I haven't even said anything about what the feeling was. The guy said to me was, but the bit I was going to say about them is they had a karmic kick in the bulls because they were in bad shape, and I was really kind of happy about it because <laughs> it was up the mountain. But yeah. the, but the guy who who we we kind of procured it from he described it as a clear flight and it was completely that it was there was Mm. nothing kind of distorted about it Mm. in any way it was so so pristinely transparent you know it was just total transparency it was total clarity it was like something you know i'm not i'm not i'm not good with psychedelics on a whole you know things like you know mushrooms LSD stuff like that I've never really gotten that well with them I get get mm-hmm. a, you know, a lot of fear attached to it and stuff like that this wasn't anything like that at all mm-hmm. I mean I mean being on holiday in the Andes probably helped you know like right. in, in a good mood you know like kind of like really right. like in the right <laughs> space but yeah right. but, it, but it but you know that was I mean that's why I got it tattooed on my arm because that was it was it was a life changer for me you know mm-hmm. You know, just yeah. that that kind of just just yeah, just a moment of making a very simple but profound decision for myself. Yeah, you know. yeah. Sorry, that I, that was a lot longer than it needed to be. No, it really wasn't. <laughs> hey, Dom, do you have a track you want to share with the group? Uh, Are you so, gonna play a song, Dom? Yeah. yeah. All so right. I, this is it's called the Crucible. The Crucible. Yeah. You did send that to me before, and I forgot that that's what you meant. So. All right, oh, that's all right. That's all right. And actually, the the keyboards on this are uh, uh, by a friend of mine called uh, Freddie Pavaricini, who's um, who you know, Freddie. Yeah, I know Freddie. Freddie, Freddie from Lulu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's he's got like this. This guy's got like lots of really beautiful vintage keyboards and stuff like that. He's he's a real kind of collector. And he he did a, on a another one of my tracks. He he did I say he actually got an Ond Martineau made. You know. Oh those? right. Oh yeah. yeah. Did With you mention that on the wire? Yeah. The, yeah, the, the, on, like, yeah. I've never yeah, seen one in real J. life. No, I've never seen one in the flesh. But he got one made. It took about like I don't know, like year and a half to get it. You know, to, for it to be delivered or something because they're handmade. And uh, he on Catch the J that the solo bit in that is him double tracking. Anyway, it's really gorgeous. You know, it's, but well, anyway, he's for people just, don't, they, that was like one of the first like continuous like pitch controller ideas. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's actually so, a ring on a wire, isn't it? And you slide yeah. it up and down, and it does a glissando thing, like on the on a wire. Yeah, exactly. So, so what, the, like what I was doing the in the second of version, what you do. Right, so? right, right. Yeah. So like like what the opening of the uh, and the end of the second version of the track that that uh, we that Mike and I did. That's uh-huh. the continuum, right? And right. The the Osmar no is is one of the one of their yeah, like you said, the grandfather of of that idea. Yeah. With the theremin, there were a couple other. Yeah, yeah. So I think what you on the on the the Martino, you actually this ring that is you you wear it. You know, you kind of put your finger through this ring which is on this wire, and you slide it like that. So that's how you do this kind of like sliding thing. But I, cool. Yeah, but that's not on this. It's some, <laughs> it's, it's, it's some, some other keyboards of his. Uh, cool. I'll tell you guys about the tuba before I do my next song. <laughs> yeah. The tuba. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is Crucible by Emperors of Rome. Yeah. Salt is in her 
her eyes Everything that she touches Eventually dies And her lips are like spies They don't move when she lies Everything that she touches Eventually dies what i love about your stuff is there's like uh like it it's sparse in a way like it feels really elemental but at the same time it's the sound is really full right and right such a such a great guitar tone and your voice fills a lot of space yeah um Thanks, yeah man. i really like that about yeah, it's that. actually and leaving the space for, for the voice leaving the space for the voice is a yeah. non-obvious choice i think it's actually one of the uh mistakes a lot of like semi-pro people make is to not just go like, hey, the voice gets to do all this. Right. <clears throat> right. It right. can be 70% yeah. of the sound. That's yeah. hard. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And then when those harmonies come in on it, you know, they're just pinpointed in that one little spot, but they, they open up the heart of they open up the heart of the song. Cool. Really nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. So man. um, yeah. And also at the end, you like it was super obvious you were the opposite of honor click. Yeah, <laughs> and that was so nice. No, it was so nice because it gets so boring to, for me. Yeah, yeah. This gets, and I'm a guy who yeah. works on a grid a lot of the time. Right, right. right. Like I'm like grid guy. Yeah, like, we're the original actually, Ableton yeah, guys. We, you know, we never use a click for any of us. I mean, um, there's uh, one. Yes, that was obvious. Oh right, so, yeah. <laughs> there was a, the, in fact, first time. Well, when we when we were recording the first session, we did uh, recording the record because it was pretty much done over two weekends at Hansa uh, mm -hmm. and uh, which you know we were lucky enough to get on downtime and um, and Alex uh, Silver uh, a friend who was who was producing it 
um didn't realize i mean we obviously we didn't have a click but he didn't realize to what degree we were happy with the tempos fluctuating you know so mm-hmm. basically in, in, in this other song we went in and we um we went into the kind of middle eight of it and we came out and it basically kind of speeds up during the middle eight and then we just slow right down when we come back into the next course. and he stopped <laughs> the tape and we're like what he goes and it was a really good take and he goes yeah you really slowed down we're like oh no yeah we know did i ask you did i ask you yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but then but with this one that's just he just reminded me now because with this one the crucible we um w- he really wanted to do it on a click this one and i was like well yeah i don't think i don't think that's gonna work and and then we tried it and of course it didn't work because it was like the thing is i said this song is not it's it's you know it's kind of the song kind of follows the words and the words right. have to kind of fall where they're gonna fall and it, i wasn't trying to be all kind of like artsy about it or like, you were well, getting lucky though I was getting lucky. <laughs> you were getting lucky. <laughs> I was getting lucky. <laughs> I was counting on it. Yeah. <laughs> and for you, getting lucky might have meant I get to hold the the guitar yeah. till the next bar. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I mean, clicks. I find that you have to be real careful with clicks because it, it does just it can just take the magic out of the shit. Where well, it's like, I, you know what I mean. I, also, I, by the way, no music ever had clicks up until like 1983. Or something. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, right. I think I think the thing about clicks is they're basically they to me their only real use is for editing. It just makes it editing easier, doesn't it? Right. You know, right. But, but or if I, you're doing something like a crawl, like you're doing something it, not in the same room as somebody. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. You know. I mean. In, I mean. We did. We did one recording. There was there were a couple of tracks on this album that we did in in a different studio afterwards. <laughs> I can't remember which which one it was, but I mean, we did do an edit because we just there was just a it, we did two we edited two takes together halfway through. Mm-hmm. It was it was like and it was really fun. It was a really fun decision to make to kind of go, hey, why don't we just take the first half of that one, right? Record <laughs> that cord <laughs> rings, right. and then we just go into the second one because we liked the second half of that one. Right. And it was like, fuck it, let's try it, and then we were like. It works. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's the edit. Yeah. Well, speaking of click, let's hear another uh, Mike playing guitar on yeah. camera live. Yeah, sure. Um, let me see. I got two new songs. I'll do the other one. Maybe would be at the end of the. I'll do this one next. All right. Um... <laughs> This was a tune I wrote in, um, this was like over two days and four bottles of wine. (laughs) (laughs) It should be the name of the the album, I guess. Yeah, 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 totally. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I had this this phrase in my head when I came home from the war. (laughs) Just like that was the phrase that had been in my head for a long time. And... um, and then, and I actually heard, I heard somebody do a song where they said, when I came home from the war or when you came home from the war. And when I heard the other song, I said, oh, I, I sat down and, and I wrote this every couple of days. All right. When I came home from the war, I sat in my backyard, lifted a beer to my lips. The river of amber that runs through me now started with that first sip busted up knuckles a bruise on my head outside the bar i'm losing my lunch when i came home from the war i got in a scrape i swear that asshole threw the first punch upside of a cruiser the trooper he knows me Size as it fastens my cuffs. When you came home from the war, it says we were all proud. You gotta quit acting so rough. I got out of jail, I got a straightened job. I run a loader and I push around sand. My co worker said, Soldier, I'm taking you out. You gotta hear this honky tonk band.
Sitting on a stool surrounded by strangers My life is an empty cup You say what you're thinking and I say nothing I'm just trying to get fucked up you turn away, the band takes the stage. I guess you then take a chance. When you say, dude, you got a dirty mouth. How about you shut up and dance? Then you press your body close to me. The sisters sing blood harmony. With my arms, I swing you round. The bass and the banjo and the fiddle sound. Like the buzzing of a bumblebee I feel your veins electricity Everything that I've thrown down There's something that I have found Well there ain't nobody Who can heal my shame I love the way that you say my name. When I came home from the war, I found a circle in which to sit and try to sort my thoughts. A man that I met there looked me straight in the eye, said don't pay double just because you bought. He's my sponsor, I can call him up. Doesn't matter if it's night or day. Now when my shift ends and I'm out of my meeting, I go down and hear the country band play. And you press your body close to me. The sisters sing blood harmony. In my arms I swing you round The bass and the banjo and the fiddle sound Like the buzzing of a bumblebee I feel your skin's electricity The only things that I've thrown down There's something that I have found Well, there ain't nobody who can heal my shame. I love the way that you say my name. Well, there ain't nobody who can heal my shame. I love the way. Yeah, man. <laughs> it was a little flubby, but beautiful, man. Dude, don't make excuses for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I haven't heard a more like beautiful and passionate song about about what you just sang about. That's fucking heartbreaking. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, man. It's, you know, for me, it's like a lot. It's it's about, um, yeah, you know, it's sort of like healing from any kind of trauma and just finding the way, you know, the war is just whatever trauma you've been through. And here it's somewhat literal where it's an actual soldier. But, um, and the song is, is really pretty literal, but um, it's kind of like that this guy finds, uh, <clears throat> that he finds this path, you know. Yeah, that's heavy. But heavy in the really good way, not heavy in the annoying way. Like heavy in like the like really awesome way. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's hopeful. It is fucking heavy. It's just like, yeah. It is yeah but it's heavy. but it's hopeful, and it, yeah. it's, it's it's a belief that people can change, and it's also it demonstrates the uh, the people around someone wanting them to change. Like, so mm -hmm. the people around the character, the cop, the whoever. I mean, these people, they believe in the potential right. to not be stuck here forever. Right. But mm -hmm. they also have to deal with the reality of you're stuck here right now. So I would really love you to not be doing this. Yeah. Right? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you know, and I think it is, you know, I think I was drawn, you know, I've drawn to it. I have a lot of friends who are, uh, who are, who are sober and they've, and I was drawn, and I am, I think, drawn to the idea. There's not like a lot of great, there's a lot of great drinking songs. There's very few songs. Not like, not there's like very few sober songs, songs that, are, right. that are just like about like, well, maybe this is a bad idea for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. But I mean, it, it, I, I immediately heard you sing that. And I wanted to send it to some people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like there's a lot of people who can connect with that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for, for me, it's it's funny because I I can't like as a as a as a lyricist, I I don't think I would ever have the uh, like I can never be that kind of direct in lyrics. <laughs> and I think I think I think it's kind of like you know I I kind of got this uh uh probably fo- sort of fear of, of it just, I don't know it's like something being too on the nose and three to show. But when you when you you do that like beautifully you know it's it's like you know that's a real strength i think to be able to do that and and to you know authentically and kind of like just hold it you know what i mean just put something across very directly like that without hiding behind imagery or anything and i know i know you can you can go where you want to go as a lyricist you know you, you can you can just decide you're gonna go i'm gonna go this way i'm gonna go that way you've got you can go in all those places but right but when, when you decide to go in that kind of direct like line like that and to be able to just kind of hold it to sustain it and just make that you know still kind of poetic at the same time as direct you know that's the thing that's a really powerful uh ability you know like, yeah and it's not just an ability it's there's there's a courage in it i mean it's a, a co- yes absolutely yeah so totally. there's an ability yeah. to walk the line without seeming like a cheesy a-hole yeah but right. there's also yeah. just it's a courage thing to even try to walk yeah. that line definitely right? Yeah, I mean, I you know, this is definitely one of the most like on the nose, like literal things <laughs> that I've ever written. You know, but there's still like I'm like the uh, when I came home from the war, I found a circle in which to sit and try to sort my thoughts. Like that to me has, a, has is like a there's a very literal circle that you sit in in the in the church basement when you're people are telling their stories. Yeah, and there's yeah. also the but there's also that to me kind of uh, widens it. There's a couple places, but. Um, yeah, but it is it is just like um, you know, it's one of those. I just I, I I literally just stayed going back to what we were talking about, being in a state to like write a song and trying to hold on to the the impetus of the song. This I really I, I don't think I I think I barely answered my phone for like two days. I was just like I knew it was there, it was there, and it was with me, and I knew I wasn't getting it on day one, <laughs> and I just kept myself like right there um with it the whole time and i was like crying i mean it was like it even still it it catches it catches me in my throat this song Um, no and that's the thing and so that's a real thing so let's just do the model of you're getting a transmission right that's one way to think about inspiration is i'm getting a transmission i happen to have tuned my antenna right so so i'm getting this transmission (laughs) but like Hey guys, the transmission doesn't always come through fully. Sometimes, you know, I've had like one or two songs I wrote where like the transmission came through, I like played it and I was like, I wrote a song. It happened in like 20 minutes, right? But a lot of the time though, it's like a noisy transmission and you have to like not answer your phone, not talk to anybody. Like you're like, I gotta, I gotta uh, gotta, like kind of clear the dirt off the windshield. I have to, I have to like uh, move the antenna. I almost (laughs) have it. I almost have it. Cause you know, you have something amazing and you have like 80% of it. But you're like, ah, the last 20% might take me out. Right? Like it might be like a boring done song if I can't quite get that last part. So the fact that you stuck with it, that's fucking amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and some of it was, you know, there were like conscious decisions I know I was making as well. Like I love, I love tunes that have conversations in them. You know, <laughs> like Randy Newman's really good at that. I'm just like that song, and they like they they're actually it's like two characters are having a conversation. So I dig that a lot. And then I was also, as I was writing it, I made the decision to make it like a country band that he's listening to, and not a rock and roll band. Mm. <clears throat> Which because I feel like you get that people get people you know, the idea of liberation through rock and roll is talked about a lot, but uh, not as much with sisters singing blood harmony and fiddles and banjos. And stuff. What is, so what I don't, what so is a blood what harmony? Is that? Yeah. A blood harmony is, is uh, when family members uh, harmonize. 
Oh. oh. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I started to anticipate that answer as you were saying it. Yeah, so like the Leuven brothers, and and it's it really you know yeah, and you get those you know Appalachian folks or whoever have been harmonizing on gospel songs their whole lives. It's just like mm. it's they're so mm. so amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> so I want to when I record it, I want to record it. And I want to get some sisters to sing blood harmony. And I feel like oh wow, well, really? You, mm-hmm. You're getting the whole hug. You're gonna, yeah, yeah, I want, I want the ma- no, I want you got to do magic. it. If you're gonna do it, you're gonna you do gotta it. You got to do it. Got to get the full do, cast the whole spell. You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking it's of funny, lyrics, I. I or, oh, sorry, man. Sorry. No, you finish. No, no, no. I insist. Speaking of lyrics, no, I was going to jump back to the Emperor's of Rome track. There's a, there's a sort of phrase you used. It was like a something ball. Oh. Uh, what is that phrase? What does that mean? It's like around minute 15. It was like yeah, a turn uh, ball or like a. Cruci- crucible? Nope. Oh, no. Untreatable. Oh, well, that's what It's a said. bit clunky, that word. Because I can't, I can't I go bull. Right, so I, I thought it was like a special, like I kind of overpronounce. Every time I hear that, I'm like, oh, I wish I could re No, that I word, actually you know? was following the lyrics very closely, and then I was like, oh, that's an expression, and I don't know what that is. Oh no, untreatable. She's untreated. That is a clunky line. So sometimes about- the clunkiness adds yeah. a lot, though. I sometimes it's 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 nice. A little thing that kind of jars. You were being a little bit lucky little in that track too. A little what? Lucky. <laughs> like Mike was being a little you, you, you lucky. Know, I'm being a little yeah. lucky too. I run the loader and I push around sand. <laughs> that was actually this was the first time I think I fit that in the way that works. <laughs> lucky. That didn't involve like, me really slowing it down. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of tongue twisters. Oh shit! Man. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, do, do we want to let him play one out? Because like we've been here for two and a half hours. Yeah, it didn't feel like that. It's no, it didn't. It felt like a 10 minute conversation. I was yeah. actually fantasizing about scheduling one for next week immediately. Yeah, it was right. so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, I'm, I'm scared my computer is going to like delete this file or something. And then we'll have lost the whole thing. You know, so no, I just don't let like, that happen. Absolutely. So I want to like, I want to finish out our interview on a high note. Yeah. Yeah. Which means that probably, which means uh, a song, Mike should do one last song. Totally, man. Sounds good. I'll do it. Yeah, now. man. All right. So this is a third of the. Um, so this is another new quarantine song, and I wrote this one. I've, I've moved in the last year and a half. I've moved like nine or ten times. I've literally been <laughs> like wow. on the run the entire time, and uh, so getting a place, moving into a house where I have the security of like my own space is a huge, has felt like a huge deal. Um, and when I signed the lease on this place, I wrote this song, which is sort of, a, it's a love song actually. And I was listening to a lot of Van Morrison when I wrote this. And, uh, but yeah, it's about having a place and being, uh, it's about grat- gratitude. <laughs> Outside my window, the birds are singing. I'm sipping on a cup of tea. Just moved in, we're getting settled. New home, Kentucky. Everybody knows a gopher goes and a tree always leaves. I smoke this joint this sacred Sunday in accomplishment of deeds, getting things done. I swept out the whole downstairs, still having fun. I don't mind doing the chores. The sun comes out, it shines on me, then it slips away. Like all those girls I used to roll around with, you know, back in the day. Well, everybody knows a bold river flows, then slips into the sea. I wrap my arms around you, woman, in fulfillment of my needs getting things done gonna kiss you to say honey please we'll still have fun come on tell me on the bee's knees take a walk in the yard <laughs> feel the soil beneath our feet we know life is hard let us treasure 
this reprieve. You pull your blouse above your head, slide your skirt down to your feet. Lay my body across the wooden boards, earth, river, sky, and breeze. Nobody knows where the blossom grows, the blossom of our love. My back is pressed against the earth. Your body moves above. You're getting things done. Loving you is all I got to do today. We're still having fun. Tell me again how dumb my haircut is. Take a walk in the yard. Feel the soil beneath our feet. We know life is hard. Let us treasure this reprieve. There is something about this house. I can feel it in my bones. The frame is true. The joy is so strong, a foundation of stone. If everybody chose the romance of goes, there'd be no one here to stay. Bless this house, bless this blessed freedom of a home in which to play. We're getting things done. Loving you is all I gotta do today. We're still having fun. Take a walk in the yard. Feel the soil beneath our feet. We know life is hard. Let us treasure this reprieve.